They're currently in the process of recruiting members as demand for services has surged. So, they're holding an info meeting following the lecture today at 7 p.m. in Mason Hall. There are flyers in the, available in the lobby, so make sure you can do that uh, after the lecture. And on your way out as well, there's a lot of stuff to grab today. The Michigan Theater, our hosts here, are handing out free admission vouchers for an upcoming screening. This is the first in the Science on Screen uh, program. They are screening Tim's Vermeer next Tuesday here, exploring the ideas of the camera obscura and recreating a Vermeer so you can get a free ticket to that on your way out. Uh, please do remember to turn off your cell phones. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A today, directly following in the screening room, out the doors to the left, down the hallway, and you'll find uh, another screening room there if you haven't been there before. So come meet Scott there, directly following this with your questions. And now for a proper introduction of today's speaker, I must give you a proper introduction of today's introducer. <laughs> Mr. Hawking, is represented by the Suzanne Hilbery Gallery. Uh, the gallery is a bastion leader of contemporary art in the Detroit area and has been since 1976. Uh, this past August, the art community here experienced a great loss as the gallery's founder and siren, Suzanne Hilbery, its namesake, passed on. Uh, Suzanne was truly the grand dame of Detroit's gallery scene and an incredibly influential force in nurturing uh, the local visual arts culture for the past 40 years. Uh, she had a sharp eye for young talent and championed a broad range of audience, or, sorry, artists uh, uh, and many generations of Detroit artists specifically, including our guest here today. Uh, Suzanne, she was also a key player in the creation of MOCAD, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, as she charged its founder, Marsha Myro, with Detroit's need for that museum to exist. Uh, she'll be sorely missed. She leaves big shoes to fill. Uh, and any of you who don't know her gallery, you should definitely get there. Currently, the gallery is showcasing an exhibit uh, which is in honor of her. This is called 39 Years Anniversary Exhibition Honoring the Memory of Suzanne Feld Hilbery. Now, the good news here is that Suzanne's legacy will live on. Uh, the gallery will continue, uh, and it will continue under the guidance of Hazel Blake, uh, Hazel joined the gallery as an assistant back in 2003 and in the accruing years became very close to Suzanne. Uh, she became almost a co-director, worked closely with her and through thick and thin up to the better end, she really took care of Suzanne. Uh, Hazel's a very special person. I've known her over the years and witnessed her, her great work. There could not be a better person to carry on this important work of bringing artists like Scott Hawking to the world's attention. And so now to introduce you to Scott, please join me in welcoming the director of the Suzanne Hilbury Gallery, Hazel Blake. Thank you, Christina. I'm very honored tonight to introduce Scott Hawking, a remarkable artist and considered by many to be the darling of Detroit's art scene. He's best known for his ambitious site-specific installations in some of Detroit's most iconic places, including the Fisher Body Plant, the Packard Plant, and the infamous Michigan Central train station. Scott's practice, though, is much broader in scope and I think heavily rooted in thoughtful observation and multidisciplinary investigation. He's not simply scouting the city for material and opportunity, but rather studying. His is a slow cumulative process which sometimes leads to a massive physical intervention or transformation. And over the last decade, many breathtakingly beautiful enigmatic photographs. He's exhibited widely and been invited to numerous artist residencies around the globe. He was just awarded a residency with the Sakatar Foundation in Brazil, and this summer he'll have a solo exhibition at the Big Car Art Space in Indianapolis. He's received many grants, including the Knight Foundation's Art Challenge and the Kresge Fellowship. Other notable recent exhibitions include participation in Lille 3000, a triennial festival in Lille, France, 
the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Detroit Institute of Arts, and Marlboro Gallery in New York. He's exhibited with the Hillberry Gallery since 2003, and we look forward to his fourth solo exhibition in early 2017. So please join us in welcoming Scott to the Michigan Theater. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, I want to say, first of all, how cool it is that the organist played David Bowie. Um, er yeah. Earlier this week, I was, like usual, scrambling to get things ready for this talk, and, uh, and David Bowie died, and suddenly nothing, it was, for me, it was a big catastrophic moment. Nothing meant more than just reading everything about David Bowie, watching everything about David Bowie, trying to make mixes of all my favorite David Bowie songs. So... Uh, we were backstage listening to this just now, and I, and I thought, God, this is almost like, this is going to be carnival music of the future. We're going to be listening to David Bowie, like that old-timey David Bowie carnival music. Uh, and it also seems appropriate, too, because the show is titled Metamorphosis. Um, Christina and I were kind of playing with titles, and we were talking about White Trash Alchemist, which is definitely more fitting for me. Um, Metamorphosis sounds almost too pretentious, but then I felt a little bit worried that I might offend some white trash people if I called myself a white trash alchemist. <laughs> but in the end, I, I, maybe I'm both. Uh, I didn't know this was a word, but it turns out it is kind of accurate for me. I'm really interested in transformations. And you'll see that throughout the whole talk tonight. Um, I have a lot of work I'm going to try and go through in a short time. So there'll be things I speed through faster and things that I get stuck on when I tell some elaborate, ridiculous story. Um, but I like to start off by saying, maybe obviously, that I'm from Detroit. Uh, I grew up in Redford Township, which you might guess is a white trash buffer zone between the western border of Detroit and the more affluent suburbs. Uh, I spent a long time as a kid kind of exploring my surroundings. I grew up by the railroad tracks. I grew up uh, really doing all kinds of investigations. Um, two things that really influenced me as a child, my father was incredibly interested in cars and junk. And my earliest memories are of sitting in like a car seat, looking out a window and knowing from the color of the underpasses that we were headed to the junkyard. That's number one. You'll see evidence of that. And number two is that I'm 40 years old. And when people talk about Detroit, for my, most of my life, when, especially when I was a child, people would talk about it uh, in this nostalgic way, what it used to be, how grand it used to be, how sad it is now, how depressing, blah, blah, blah. I mean, in some cases, the commentary that still continues to this day is really, really, uh, yeah, just uh, so buried in nostalgia that people wish that it would just disappear and be reborn as something great again. But for me, in 40 years, this is all I've ever known. I never saw the heyday. I never saw the grand Detroit. I saw this. So for me... Starting off with this, I started to investigate this more and find the beauty in this, find the beauty in the transition, find the beauty in the way nature came back. These are places that I would explore in the 90s. In the 1990s, I started making art. I started walking around the city, uh, driving as well, but I spent a lot of time walking. For about three years, I didn't have a car. And not having a car in Detroit and relying on the bus system, everything slows down. This is the familiar landscape around me around that time. But even though I took photos, I really wasn't thinking photographically. I was thinking more about being broke and wanting to make art with the material that was free. So two things happened. There was an abundance of material, but there was also, I mean, I, was, I didn't have any money. There was an abundance of material that's free, but there was also just, God, when you're an artist, you see opportunity in this. It's not, you don't see devastation. You see, oh, I could do an installation here. I could use all this stuff to make a sculpture. People abandon things in Detroit. People throw out their trash and dead-end streets, even boats. So I, I started off by gathering a lot of objects. This is a great image to me because this is like everything in the 1990s, everything from my childhood in one image. I'm going to use my awesome laser pointer. 
There's an abandoned boat. There's an abandoned burned out car. There's mattresses, tires. This is 33rd Street. Somebody spray painted it on a sign so you would know. This is all gone now. Detroit is changing. You can't find this the same way you could back then. I didn't even know that that would happen. But at that time, I'd be in these places and I would think, this is wasted material. I want to use this. This is material that somebody with money at some time owned. They own this whole property. I could never own a property like this. And they just abandoned it. And that made me angry. I hate that there was so much wasted material. So not only using what had been wasted and thinking about it as a beautiful object that nature has kind of taken apart, but also I loved being in these places. They were meditative to me. They were like my, my walk in the woods. Nature had taken back areas of Detroit and you could find your natural solace in the city from my perspective. This is an old Dodge, and there it is in the box in the lower left. So this was the first real, I made a lot of sculptures, I took a lot of objects out of abandoned buildings, and I made a lot of sculptures early on when I was in school. But this is the first real big installation I did. It was a collaboration with a, an artist, a Detroit artist named Clinton Snyder, and we made this entire room-sized installation called Relics. So originally it was this idea of, of kind of categorizing what we found, like scientifically. Taking the organic process and gritting it off the same way you might do if you were in a natural history museum. It's modular, it can be assembled in different ways in different installations. All of it has kind of been sold off and removed to different places. You can see another incarnation of it here where it curves. And it started to kind of progress over time to where I started thinking about different objects, even bigger objects. How much do you have to do to something to make it an artwork? Is artwork already existing? Is, is the entropy artwork? Can nature make artwork? How does a person insert themselves to change that course? So taking something and cutting it and fitting it into a box is one thing, but taking a whole boat out of a vacant lot and sticking it in a box, here's where it was. There was a tree growing through it, so essentially I took it out of this vacant lot and I made a column go through it. Now, nobody's going to buy this stuff, and I, I don't make stuff based on that, but it started to kind of evolve for me, just the combination of trying to use what had been wasted, but also document these things, this place and time in Detroit that for me I found beautiful, the transition, the same way most transitions can be really beautiful, sunsets can be beautiful, sunrises can be beautiful. Detroit has been experiencing this real transition pretty much my whole lifetime, so finding the beauty in that transition. The photos I took over time were mostly documentary. Like I, I, would, I would think about taking photos of places, but I didn't think of them as artwork for a long time because I wasn't trained in photography. I was making sculptures. But through my travels throughout the city, I started to kind of amass all these photos of the places and things that I found. So next thing you know, I have a series of shipwrecks, abandoned boats on abandoned streets. Now again, in some cases, I think people might say, oh, that's so sad, that's so terrible, all this stuff is wasted. But for me, there's something poetic. When you think about a city that's built on a river, like most cities, where it's all about the water, and then eventually the water becomes less important because we become the automobile city. And then the automobile kind of moves away from the city as well, but we've got all these streets. So next thing you know, we've got abandoned boats on abandoned streets. This is really American right here, freestyle. See that eagle? And, of course, abandoned cars as well. That's an ongoing series. A lot of these projects are ongoing. I'm completely fine with them going on for decades, if that's how long it takes. But the transition between... Let's see if I can go backwards here. That boat has been scrapped. See the big hole there? They took an engine out of it. Scrappers. Scrappers are guys who basically thrive on the abandonment. If there's abandoned buildings, that means there's abandoned metal and things you can resell. And during the 80s into the 90s, Detroit became such a huge amount of abandoned factories and whatnot that the legion of scrappers exploded. And then it got even worse during the Iraq War where the price of, of semi-precious metals like copper really skyrocketed. This guy would sneak in the back of the scrapyard through that smiley face hole steal the scrap, and then go back around the front of the scrapyard and resell it. 
These people figured that out. So they wrote this on the back, on the railroad side, so that nobody would sneak in. This is the top of the Lee Plaza, which is like a 14, 15-story tower in Detroit that's been abandoned for many years. used to have a copper roof. You can see the copper there. All that copper is gone now. Eventually, the copper price got so lucrative that guys went inside those peaks and busted holes out and ripped it, and it fell like 14 flights down. Uh, whereas in the old days, when I took this photo, it would have been too risky, certain death. You know, you'd slide down off the roof. But when that copper price goes up, all is fair. This is a trail in the Michigan Central Station where someone dragged out a giant piece of scrap. And here's Country Boy. He was a guy who I got to know really good because I would go in these buildings and he would go in these buildings. We'd be doing different things, but we were kind of doing the same thing. And he's burning the plastic off the copper wire. You can get more money when you burn the plastic off. This is Devil's Night, the notorious night when things get burned in Detroit and a guy's hauling like an aluminum sheet 20 feet long on a shopping cart. No big deal. So I made this installation where I bought 200 pounds of copper off a country boy and I put it at the ground and you had to pull this pulley. You had to lift the 200 pounds of copper to get to your caramel corn, which is what country would get at, from the gas station across the street when he got money. This kind of way of trying to use what's around me, but also uh, everything I saw because of walking around the city, everything I saw that bothered me. Tires. Dumping tires. Tires cost $2. If you go to your, your tire changing shop, your Bell Tire, and you need, you need to get a replacement and you have a flat tire, they'll charge you $2 to get rid of that tire. And that adds up. They got 1,000 tires. That means they have to pay $2,000 to properly get rid of those tires. So what do they do? They drive into the city of Detroit where nobody cares, where nobody looks, and they dump it. This is an abandoned trailer park next to city airport, and years ago it was maybe the best place in the world to dump tires. So in 2006 I decided I wanted to make a sculpture out of the tires, and I started making it on site at the abandoned trailer park. Lo and behold, the idea of the Museum of Contemporary Detroit comes along. And they say to me, Scott, do you have any idea for maybe making a installation for a fundraiser for the Museum of Contemporary Art? And I say, sure, I'm building a tire pyramid in an abandoned trailer park in Detroit's east side. Uh, what if I did that? And I really didn't think they'd say yes. And they said, sure, do that. So I went from building a tire pyramid in an abandoned trailer park to hauling all those tires from Detroit to an affluent suburb where I would build a tire pyramid on someone's front lawn. As you can see, the cops didn't believe it. Nobody, I, I mean, I didn't believe it. It was ridiculous. So here we are building the tire pyramid. That's my friend Dylan in the Tyvek soup. So if you've ever picked up a tire that's been sitting outside and gets wa water inside of it, uh, they're very nasty. I've never been splashed with so much uh, grotesque water in my life, all in the name of art. Um, and there were, ended, ended up being 2,109 tires. You can see the gentleman in the neighborhood over there. Um, one of my favorite things about this project was the, the separation between the way people would think about it in the inner city versus how they would think about it in the suburbs. So in the inner city, they really, they, they knew I had figured out some way to make money on finding these tires. Like, <laughs> let me in on a secret how you're making money off of these old tires. But in the suburbs, what, all they wanted to know was how long. Like, how long is this shit going to be here? <laughs> so luckily for them, it was only there for about two weeks. I don't even know if it was that long. It wasn't there that long. Uh, and then we removed it, and then my favorite part happened. <laughs> I didn't get enough really good photos of this. And again, this is right on the cusp of me transitioning from photographing things and thinking about them as documents to thinking about photographs as potential artwork. And so, lo and behold, I have this great thing, but I didn't, I didn't get the best photos of it, and it's one of the things that transitions. The next project, I thought, I need to document these things better. Let me try up here. There we go. So another thing is that I get weird ideas that don't seem to be in line with everything else I'm doing. I think that nowadays you can be an artist uh, and not be pigeonholed, not be not have your shtick, not have your style. You get an idea that's outside of, of your, your path and you can do it. You can manifest it in whatever way you want. To me, there's a thread. It might not seem like it, but the thread is usually things that inspire me or bother me or just things that I want to make some statement about. So at the time, right around that same time, there were all these exhibitions, 
public art exhibitions where people were making fiberglass animals, cows uh, in Chicago and in Zurich, uh, moose in Toronto, bears in Berlin. Everywhere I'd go, it'd be these like cows like Elvis or something. You know, something that I felt like people were getting money for and it was the extent of public art and it wasn't pushing it enough for me. It wasn't making enough of a statement. So I made my own version. And I had friends help me. So I went through the same process where you were going to paint an animal, but it, the animals were going to be mutilated and fucked up in the ways they really are in nature. So here's the cow mutilated by aliens. There's any kind of animal that's trapped by, for its fur would be trapped. This is a raccoon trap, but he's, he's in a, a disco ball state. That's a grizzly bear that's been trapped and chewed off his leg. There's uh, bushmeat, which is when they kill gorillas in Africa for food, but it's also grape ape. That's a drowning polar bear painted like uh, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. Chimpanzee with SpongeBob SquarePants being tested. Buffalo with a ratio of bullet holes to arrows for how much buffalo were killed uh, versus, you know, white men versus Native Americans. And then shark finning. Oh my God, shark finning is the worst. I learned so much about the plight of animals during this project. Shark finning, they cut off all the fins so you can have shark fin soup and they just toss the carcass of the shark back in the ocean so they can get more shark fins on the boat. This is a taxidermy form. So if you kill a deer and it has a baby inside and you want to stuff the baby, that's the form you buy. I don't have a very good transition for this. <laughs> so... I, I flip-flop all around. Like I said, I have a lot of different ideas. Um, and one of, one of the things I'm really interested in, I'm still working on this project right now, is the ancient history of Detroit. Um, similar to my feeling in general about people saying, oh, Detroit used to be this, Detroit used to be that, I feel like we have short-term memories because Detroit has only been the auto capital for 100 or so years. Detroit has only been Detroit for 300 or so years. Detroit has had people living in that part of the river for thousands of years. So a lot of themes in my work have to do with thinking about a longer view, thinking about what humans do through time on earth and how we repeat the same patterns and how if we think we've somehow progressed or achieved something, we're not that much different than we've ever been. And to me, to reflect on that, I want to focus on ancient things. So I've been working on this long-term project. There's not a lot of history of this. By the time the Europeans came to Detroit and started doing things like farming, boy, the earthworks of Detroit, the ancient artifacts of Detroit were just completely obliterated. Uh, there's stories about people writing their memoirs of how they would go down to the shore and dig up the bones of the savages and put them on the shelf in their fort, all the skulls they would find. It's terrible, but it's how things were back then. So to me, this is a part of history that's hidden, but it's important to bring back. So it's a long-term project. I started this probably 2007. These are the sites where earthworks used to be. And this is what's there now. Seagulls, lots of seagulls. The riverfront, all the industry. Some of the most industrialized parts of Detroit are where the original tribes were because they were the best parts. This is Detroit. This is Detroit. That's an old velodrome along Mound Road. Mound Road was named Mound Road because there was a Native American mound. This is a contemporary mound. So me playing with the idea of what will our earthworks be? What will we leave behind? What will our artifacts be that people interpret us from? When I build that installation called Relics that I showed you first with all the grid and all the things inside, I'm thinking about what are people gonna, how are they going to decipher us? How are they going to decipher our language? Are they going to get sarcasm? Do we get sarcasm now? When we look back and decipher languages, how can we possibly get the eccentricities of that time? There's so much guessing. There's so much guessing about the people, the ancient people, and I, I, I really think about us that way too. How will people interpret us? These are basically rubble piles that we've left behind. You tore down a building, you piled it over, but there's artifacts in there. There's cast concrete in there. There's plastic in there. A lot of plastic. These are our contemporary earthworks. I made this piece called Detroit Midden Mount. I actually installed it at Gallery Project here in Ann Arbor, boy, maybe eight or nine years ago. It was all the, the junk in my studio that was metal that I just decided, oh, I'm going to 
pile it up and just put it in the gallery and it's my trash mound. Nobody bought it. I had to take it back home. So an area of the city that I've been documenting in that same way is called the I-94 Industrial Park Renaissance Zone. It used to be a neighborhood. They tore the whole thing down. They tried to make it lucrative so people would come and build giant multifunctional conglomerate facilities. But for many years, that didn't happen, probably about 10 years. Something has recently happened. Interestingly enough, bought by and built by the same guy who owns the Ambassador Bridge and the Michigan Central train, train Station, Maddie Maroon. Um, but for many years, it just kind of got taken over by nature. And again, the reason this is interesting to me is because that wasn't the plan. But what happened was nature didn't care. Nature took over, and this place became abundant with flowers and butterflies and rabbits and stray dogs and evidence of houses used to be there because somebody planted this this uh, lilac bush. Tulips would pop up. You can see here there's a little bird flying over the water. This is a street, but now it's become a little bit of a canal. So whereas some people might look at this and go, oh, it's a shame, it's so sad, I can't believe. I look at it and go, yeah, nature wins. No matter what fucked up thing we do as humans, in the end, nature will win. That's a hot tub, by the way. The city would try and mow the lawn out there, but they would only get so far. They would just decide, no, no, we're done. They didn't want to run over like an engine block or something. So the first project I really feel like I collaborated with uh, photography and sculpture intentionally was this project. This is Fisher Body 21. It's a two-minute walk from where I've lived for 15 years. Actually, it's a two-minute walk from where I've lived for 20 years. I just live in a different place now. And I spent about eight months in there using the material I found, building this giant pyramid. So the pyramid is made out of these wooden blocks that litter the floor. The floors of these concrete buildings would often have wooden blocks to, as shock absorbers, as uh, insulators. You know, they were just kind of like a, a way to, to uh, deal with the giant machinery that's all in these factories. Well, over the many years of being abandoned, a concrete building becomes like a cave. Stalactites and the stalagmites form. Everything starts to buckle and come up and, and move like tectonics of the earth. Um, so this is the first time I thought about a project where I was going to make a site-specific sculpture that would be encountered. People would find it, discover it. People would have an experience with it. But those people would probably be different than the people who found the photo series and go to a gallery or museum to see the photos. So thinking about two different pieces, really. Thinking about two different projects. It was a light bulb moment. It really was. It was like an epiphany of thinking... Shit, all these years I've been going into these buildings and really loving them. They were like a solace for me. But I would take stuff out and I would work in my studio. And this project was the one where I felt, I want to work here. The experience is here. I want this to be something important. And not only that, but the buildings to me are so beautiful and I feel like people don't see it. And, or maybe their way of thinking is based in some kind of memory of what it used to be. So what makes something different? What makes a ruin become a monument? What makes someone's mentality of it? And I think that's time. I think it's the time it takes before you, you look and you don't have the, the real connection to it, so you can kind of see it from a distance. So for me, the way to jog people's perception was to somehow infiltrate or collaborate with the building to make something that, in a way, now you can see the building differently. You can think about the building differently. I went to China right after that, found an abandoned building. It was a bit dangerous. And I built some stuff out of bamboo and I built another pyramid. Same kind of scenario, I just wanted to get in there, do something quickly. This building was torn down two weeks after I did this. I went to Florida after that. Again, I'm not really good at transitions. This is kind of chronological though, so you're getting the gist of it. Um, I went to Florida and I was in this area where Ponce de Leon was trying to discover the Fountain of Youth and I decided I'd make a Fountain of Youth vending machine where if you had two quarters and you were lucky enough to stumble upon it in the middle of the scrub jungle of New Smyrna Beach, you could have eternal life. Good luck. Yeah, I don't think anyone found it. Um, but it really does speak to a, a trend that I, I really love about my work is that I have this constant practice of doing things that I have no possession over. In the end, they're going to get destroyed. In the end, they're gone. 
I'm, I'm either doing something illegal like trespassing or using materials that aren't mine or the building will get torn down or the building will burn down or it'll be in the middle of a jungle and I'll never go back there again. But this, this constant practice of letting go of the possessiveness of the material I think is really good for me. It's kind of part of my meditative practice. So back in Detroit, this is a building that I actually had been going into, like most of these places, for many years and finally decided to do a site-specific work inside of it. And I did it as an exhibition here at U of M, at the Institute of Humanities. Uh, Amanda Krugliak brought me in to do a fellowship. This is probably five or six years ago. And I basically tried to do a kind of pseudo-archaeological investigation of this building. It was originally a post office, and then it became a public school warehouse, and then it got abandoned after being burned a couple of times. So there was this real organic process happening in this building. And I gathered all these artifacts, and I thought about it like, how would people see us if they were discovering these things? What would they think when they find all the books? The books are titled Discoveries, you know, and it sounds really majestic and amazing, but they're just these boring English books. These are stalagmites. These are stalagmites that are made when the water gets through the concrete building and drips down onto all the things on the ground. In this case, whatever it dripped onto, it would take the form of books. Uh, I think there's a three-ring binder over there at the very end. Um, that's a melted traffic cone. A lot of these are plastic pieces. It just depended on what it dripped onto. To me, these are artifacts. These are toys. That's glitter. That's melted glitter on the right. And these are basically like little mnemonic devices for kids. Plastic bowling pins. This is a pile of drinking straws melted into what looks like probably anything else, but not drinking straws. A nest or something. But again, if it's plastic, it's going to last a long time. There's a chance someone might dig that up and go, what the hell was this? The new book of knowledge, again, not really that interesting. Seems pretty cool. I decided these were fertility dials. It looks like a freeze. It looks like uh, some kind of sculpted freeze, but it's just a melted hunk of plastic. And I made a cauldron out of the books. So the earthwork, an ancient idea, the idea of artifacts, the idea of thinking about us in terms of artifacts and working kind of pseudo-archaeologically, I went to St. Louis. This is a map of St. Louis uh, from 1801, I believe. Those are earthworks. So I went to all of those sites and photographed what they are now and decided these are the new mounds. This is like their Fago. That truck is a new mound. And the building that I would find in the place of where a mound was would often be abandoned. In this case, it was a toxic waste transfer station. So I made a toxic waste glove mound. This is the 55-gallon drums they left behind. A lot of the work I do is probably not good for me. Um, and I've gotten better at being smart about wearing things, but I, for a long time I wasn't very smart about that. So here's the thing that happens over and over again. I start working in an abandoned building that's been busted open for years, and next thing you know, it gets sealed up. In a way, I'm kind of helping it, I guess. Here's an abandoned building where a mound was. I made a little stone circle on the inside. From the top of the building, you can see the Mississippi River and an abandoned, or sorry, a homeless uh, village. People have set up their own camp by the Mississippi. And I decided these are the new tribesmen. This is the new Mississippians. So on the top of the building, I put a tent for the chief. And artifacts. All the artifacts I gathered. Again, trying to decide what they were. These are foundry forms, but you wouldn't know that. Artifacts become artifacts quicker nowadays. A lot of things that were used 100 years ago, 50 years ago, we wouldn't know what the hell they are now. It happens really fast that things become obsolete. Everybody who owns a computer knows that. I decided that was a sun god. Back to Detroit. So, some of the projects in Detroit that I did site specifically were in buildings I'd been going into for years. Places that I was really familiar with. And I had a sense that maybe things were changing. That if I didn't do something soon, things would change. In this case, the Packard plant, which is one of the iconic abandoned buildings in Detroit. It's huge, huge amount of space. And in one part of the building, there were all these television sets. The life cycle of a lot of the old factories in Detroit is that at some point, they become a storage facility. There's just nothing else to do with them except people renting storage space. So in this place, TVs, and I hauled them to the roof where the roof had collapsed, and I put them on top of these columns, 
and decided this was the new pantheon of the gods. I called it the Garden of the Gods. That's based on, a, a, I think there's a park in Indiana, in southern Indiana. But I like this idea of, of putting statues on pedestals. The gods on pedestals. This is Zeus all by himself. Photographed it through time as things collapsed more. And the building really is still collapsing. Like a lot of places in Detroit, it's all changed now. That part of the building is torn down where I've got the TVs and the rest of the, the Packer plant has been bought by a Spanish slash Peruvian uh, developer who's potentially going to renovate it. So we'll see. I did a similar project in upstate New York, abandoned power plant. That's all styrofoam. Again, material that's going to last for a long time. And I decided I was Sisyphus. And Sisyphus builds the stone or the sphere. Sometimes I get trapped in abandoned buildings at night if the cops come. And then I made it levitate, which is really, really not what's happening, but it looks like it. Um, I had this whole narrative that I would build this thing called the Voice of Space. Which is, it's based on a McGree painting, really mystical McGree painting, creating mythologies. I'm really interested in mythology. I think that we live in our own mythology, just the way ancient people lived in their own mythologies. And at the end of the story, Sisyphus is supposed to commit suicide and have to rebuild the thing again, but... You can see him way up in the hole there, the very top. There he is. So another kind of stone. This is in Australia. And I, I really do feel like, I say I work site specifically, and it's true. Detroit has a lot of what you see in my work when I work in Detroit. When I go to Australia, in this case, in the middle of the bush, I work with sticks, I work with bones. I built a giant horse-type cow thing, and I tried to ride it. And it's based on this 1950s photo of a famous Australian artist who found this dead horse in the desert and took this photo of himself. And I saw that photo, and I thought, shit, I need to recreate that. It was close. <laughs> He's more handsome than me. So back in Detroit, again, trying to use what's been wasted, there's this phenomenon that happens. It's not just in the inner city. It happens all over. When the snow melts and you see how much trash is everywhere, and it's plastic bags. So I got really interested in just trying to use all these plastic bags. As you can see from this diagram, Tartarus is the space between hell and chaos. There's something worse than hell. It's Tartarus. That's where like, the gods were really bad went. In fact, I think that's where Sisyphus was. One of the gods who was there was Tantalus. Tantalus was the god who was punished to always be in a pool of water. And whenever he would go to drink it, the water would disappear. Whenever he would reach for fruits, the trees would pull back. So he was forever hungry and forever thirsty. Bingo. It was a gross installation. And my favorite part about it was that all these people came expecting something. And instead, their heads were touching these nasty plastic bags and... They were all crowded in there, and they were miserable. And I thought, okay, success. <laughs> so again, because I'm always going around the city and exploring everything, I, just, I have concurrent projects. I'm working on all these different things at once. And one of the projects, a little bit of levity, is uh, bad graffiti. So I still don't know what this means. <laughs> we're going to have a Q&A after this. If anybody has any theories, um, you can present them. But uh, all the things I would see around the city that would crack me up, and usually it would be drunken people scrawling something or, or whatever. But, so I just decided, well, why is that not a photo series? Why, why is it not? Why can't that be its own project? So again, like, and I still photograph this shit, even if I see it today, I can't resist it. But I did so many so fast that I did end up making a book of it. I just want to say that Anytime you're doing graffiti and you write in cursive, it kind of instantly, I'm not sure about the cursive graffiti. This one is really filled with a lot of information. A lot's going on in this one. I like the little baby turtle in the middle there. If you, there's a penis way on the end. Um, a lot of penises, a lot of penises. I don't think they meant what they meant, but I think it works. <laughs> Nobody's going to go in there, right? 
I like picturing this one, like Dirty Ed walking by. <laughs> and so this is kind of a nice tie-in because I, I like the old signs too. So it, even though I'm photographing the bad graffiti, I'm also interested in this kind of old signage. This is, uh, you know, it's on the edge. It's kind of this mystical graffiti. It's gang graffiti, but yet it looks astrological. It's like cryptograms, you know, it's hieroglyphics. So I'm interested in documenting all these places in Detroit that have this kind of urban folk art, the kind of history, they mean something, but it's, it's disappearing pretty quickly. A lot of these places are gone. I think that there was a part of me that realized I'd see things in the city that were important or interesting to me, and then they started disappearing, and then I thought, shit, this is not going to last forever. And that realization has made me a lot more vigilant about documenting places that really show the hand of an artist. It used to say Fairlane or something, you know, but now it just says Air. That's a Geo Metro, by the way. Geo Metro. I mean, this is long gone. Mayor Archer? It's a long time ago. Some, that's been painted over. A lot of this stuff gets painted over because people think, oh, we've got to clean this building up. That's gone too. Someone painted a white wall over it. So trying to capture things. He's been removed. Mr. Iowa, he's been, his stump has been removed. Trying to capture things before they're gone. I love that pizza can't be translated into Arabic. <laughs> Chaldean town. It's a part of Detroit, but it's also been painted over. Uh, this is Sidney Boggs Chocolates, which became the haunted bus ride too. Bloody uh, skeleton head there. So these are ongoing series. This is, I'm still photographing these. I'm still kind of capturing all this. And in most cases, they're already gone. Uh, I'm going to try and wrap up here pretty quickly. Let me see how much time I have. I, I've got to make sure because I'm always really bad about this. Um, this is an installation I did based on alchemy. And I have an interest, again, in mythology, mysticism. Alchemy, to me, is kind of a... It's like a lot of things. It's, it's got a, a code to it, that it, a symbology to it, that often seems really confusing and maybe doesn't make any sense. But I love the imagery of the symbology. I love the imagery that goes along with alchemy. So I got this 1955 mercury, and mercury is one of the three elements involved in alchemy. Mercury, sulfur, and salt. I decided to make this installation based on this transformation. So in this case, the transformation was the idea of the end of the world. Uh, I did an initial installation with all these taxidermied animals, all these dead animals, in a natural history museum in Grand Rapids, a former natural history museum. And then I kind of further redid and maybe improved upon the installation at the Suzanne Hilbery Gallery in 2012 that coincided with the Mayan calendar end date, or supposed Mayan calendar end date. So the idea to me was playing with destruction mythology, creation mythology, the idea of the messenger, the winged messenger, which is Mercury, the winged messenger, the birds, the transition into death. Mercury was essentially Anubis. Mercury is Hermes. It's the, the god that would not only be the messenger and communicator between the earthly people and the immortals, but also the person who would usher you into the afterlife. This is the end of the world bookshelf. All of these books, in some way, relate to an idea of how the world will end. Again, coinciding with the Mayan calendar end date. So my main interest in all this is that I think that this is not a unique thing. I think that humans throughout history have always been thinking how we're going to end and where we came from. This is a repetitive thing. We don't know. We don't know where we came from. We don't know our creation story, and we don't know our ending story. But there's a lot of mythologies about it. Maya, the word Maya, as in the Mayans, also is a Hindu, Hindu word, and in Hindu it means that this world is an illusion. So if the world is an illusion, how can it end? I think in general I like the idea that, well, I think I, I believe that we just don't know shit. We're always guessing. And I like that. I like that life is a mystery. So all these different theories, whether it's scientific, religious, spiritual, the idea of death being a transformation, Nobody really knows. So speaking of death and decay, 
and endings and transformations. Nighttime in Detroit, I think, has a certain mysticism and mythology to it. But for me, it's extremely peaceful and meditative. I go out at night a lot to take photos. It's still, it's quiet. There's a lot of, boy, there's a lot, a lot of uh, solitude that can be found in Detroit. There's a lot of peace. And you wouldn't expect that because there's so much stories about Detroit being dangerous and you're going to get killed and all these things. But I find it. And these photos often take a long time. It can, I can be out there for hours taking photos. So this is my piece. This is the Obama gas station, which, by the way, if you look at the prices, you can tell how old this photo is. New abandoned houses. Shipwrecks, again. Spaceships. <laughs> Remember that big flood we had? I-94 became a river. This guy did not make it. His lights went out soon after this photo was taken. So there's a peace I find in Detroit at night. And I still take these photos. It's still an ongoing series. A recent project I did at the train station in Detroit, uh, which is the, again, iconic abandoned building, was I built this carn, a stone egg, essentially, out of the marble that used to line the walls. And again, I spent many years going in this building. I'm very familiar with it. And to decide to collaborate with it was a heavy thing. Like, what can you do in a building that's already so impressive that isn't going to be dwarfed, that isn't going to be just, the building is going to be more impressive than what you do. But to me, the egg, just like the pyramid, just like a lot of things I make, these are archetypal symbols. These are things that they, they somehow in your DNA mean something. And whether it's because of humans being stacking stones for thousands of years, whether they're cavemen or whatnot, just the idea of marking a place, marking a grave, marking a cave, or the kind of egg-formed entity that this feels like. If you come up the stairs and encounter this, there's a strange thing. I think I, I ran into people who would find it and kind of be startled. Like Their initial feeling is one of, whoa, what the hell is that? And in general, if I make something and someone's reaction is, whoa, what the fuck is that? Then I feel like I've got success. When I was making this, the guys working on the building were taking all the asbestos out. And they told me I had to stop because it was too heavy. But then they built this for me so I could keep working. That's on the floor below. And I thought, wow, collaboration. They even painted it red. <laughs> the overarching idea of working in abandoned buildings to me is kind of this cast concrete in the auto age idea. All the photos of, of projects done in cast concrete buildings and all the stalagmites and stalactites found, I've exhibited those as a group before. That's me riding a giant dodo. Um, so again, trying to use what's been wasted, trying to, uh, what I find uh, kind of leads to ideas or ties in with my own mythology ideas. So this is an abandoned biblical story park in northern Michigan, and this is an abandoned dinosaur park in the Irish Hills, which some of you might have even know about, uh, prehistoric forest. So I tried to get a bunch of that stuff. <laughs> Imagine being pulled over, right? right near the border. And the first incarnation of it was at MOCAD. And I, I just kind of tried to create this mythological ceremonial scene that could be in the future, could be in the past. I don't know, but I like playing with it. That's Zeb there. That's not really... The elephant doesn't have legs. Um, and that's, to me, that's the ambiguous object of worship in the center there. It could be anything. So I went to Pittsburgh and kind of did the real version of this in Pittsburgh. That, despite what it looks like, is not a gigantic, metallic, vaginal, double-ended dildo machine. <laughs> that is a, what's called a uh, torpedo car, and they will put molten iron in it, and then it will pour out like a giant ladle in the steel industry. So in Pittsburgh, the steel industry, blah, blah, blah. I'd never seen that before. To me, this was like a crazy herm hermaphroditic object. Like, this is the best thing in the world but it's massive and huge. So instead, we recreated one in the center of this space at the mattress factory in Pittsburgh, and this became the obscure object of worship. This became the thing that we don't know what it is anymore, but we discover and suddenly go, whoa, this is the, the relic, the artifact, this is special. 
There they are worshiping. And I had uh, my friend here be the model to show you that if you were an intrepid art explorer, you could climb that ladder and see that inside the molten volcanic vagina hole, there was a really cool den. You had to sneak in there, but there was a fireplace. Great books like Dante's Inferno. And I would give them all different symbols to hold so they'd have masks that they would wear. Again, it's this idea of Thinking about us in the past, thinking about us in the future, primitive, mask wearing, talismanic holding, and a giant sloth. You know, a giant sloth. So many people took selfies with a sloth. I could have charged a lot of money and made. And the last incarnation I did at Art Prize, same kind of thing, another object of worship. But in this case, I painted the background like a 1970s prog rock album. I thought that would be really good. Uh, I did a project in, in Germany. They brought me to Germany. They thought, you're from Detroit. You do auto stuff. And they brought me to the auto city in Germany, which is uh, Wolfsburg, where they make the Volkswagens. And I said, screw you. I'm going to work in this abandoned quarry. And I made this uh, couple sculptures out of the abandoned quarry. I took artifacts, did an installation. Another kind of archaeological exhibition I was in was called The Way of the Shovel. It was in Chicago at the MCA. And again, they wanted me to do something site-specific, but then they got worried I was going to bring insects into the museum. So instead, I just brought this giant hunking thing from Detroit, which I called Rusty Sputnik. And I decided this is a future space artifact, you know? But it's not a space artifact. It is a rooftop cyclonic dust collector that I just took out of a building and threw in the museum. I also took a weed whipper in areas of Detroit and decided to make crop circles. <laughs> uh, they were documented with the drone photography. I, I want to keep doing this. I want to do it in the snow. I want to do it in vacant lots. It's kind of an extension of an idea of using vacant lots I've had for a long time. But like a lot of my ideas, I decide to do them, and then right after I decide to do them, the area that I want to work in has changed, whether that's an abandoned building or a vacant lot. In this case, this whole vacant lot has been cleaned up. But at the time, you can see how massive it was. This is based on the uh, crop circle design that was used on a Led Zeppelin box set. Very important to me. So this last year, 2015, I did three big installations. This was done in a former auto factory in Detroit that later became, at one time, a pickle factory. So they started calling the place the pickle factory. And the way I like to work, it's, it's kind of extended to the point where I feel confident I can go anywhere and figure something out. So in this case, the old auto factory had all kinds of strange auto parts that were in there, but it also had the family history of these people who've owned it for three generations. And I just gathered everything I could, and everything I'd find, they would go, oh, really, you're interested in that? Oh, we might have a fish down the street. And, okay, I'll go get that fish. Oh, we might have another fish. And next thing you know, I was getting stuff out of all their buildings to make this kind of strange futuristic uh, man cave, like a, a hunting cabin slash office slash, I don't know, room full of giant chrome penises that you have to enter to get through to the desk. It just became, to me, this, this strange, hard-to-place-in-time office space. And people came in thinking it was really an office. But it's the entire family history. I also found a dead bat. I threw him in a little box. Somebody was reading that book called Sorority in the Bathroom. I found that. <laughs> These are all the paperbacks I found. I just put them in backwards. Suddenly it became like a little painting. So they liked it so much, which again, just like when I'm building something in an abandoned building and a scrapper encounters it or a homeless guy encounters it or just anyone who's not involved in the art scene encounters something, I'm really, in, I'm really curious to see how they react. In this case, these guys, three generations of working in the auto industry, loved this piece. Whereas I thought they would think, this is fucking weird, we've got to get rid of these chrome penises. They loved it so much that they decided to keep it. So it's permanently installed in their building now. I love that lamp. The two last projects I worked on, and this one's still not done. I went up north into Michigan's thumb. I got asked to do a project with a barn. There's the barn. Seemed like a bad idea, to be honest. I mean... I've never worked with a barn before. It's massive. 
There was a whole village of raccoons living in there. I destroyed Raccoon Village. But during the process, yeah, I heard some awes in the audience. Trust me, they, they moved on to other hay piles or something. Essentially, I had the communal raccoon pooping grounds. So it wasn't so much where they lived as where they pooped. Um, I learned how to use a lot of really great farming equipment, and I really kind of learned the farming ways, like the way farmers do everything. They burn a lot of stuff. I burned a lot of things. I took out all the wood. I yanked it down. The things we didn't use, we burned. But all the wood that I used came from the barn. We stuck these four telephone poles in the ground. That's inside the silo. Burned things we didn't want. A lot of burning. I'd be there alone a lot. This is me alone using three orange vehicles to do everything. That was probably playing David Bowie at the time. I don't know. It got kind of crazy. I cut myself a lot. That's when I got my tetanus shot. Then these kittens appeared. It was me. It was like a hang-in poster. Hang-in there poster appeared. All these kittens came out. This storm nearly killed me. I've never seen a storm like that in my life. I don't know if any of you have, but honestly, I was so enamored with it as it was coming towards me about to kill me. I survived it. In fact, not only did I survive it, the kitten survived it. <laughs> which was amazing. I don't know where they were, but they survived it. Um, and this took me about three months. And so I essentially recreated the barn as a sculpture. Uh, I pitched it as I was going to turn it into a boat, turn a barn upside down and make a boat. But in the end, it just became this ambiguous sculpture that was based on a lot of things to me, a ship, uh, the idea of kind of a, a, a vessel as a, another archetypal image, um, something kind of nest-like, primal. The animals could come back and use it again. And I really ended up loving working up there. This is inside. So I made my own secret hatch so I can go inside. I feel myself going up there occasionally, putting a hammock in there and just living inside the ship. And the other project I just finished is in Lille, France. So it's a city about an hour north of Paris. It's very close to Belgium. It's considered historically Flanders, so it's kind of a, a Flemish area. Very historic place. And it's an old train station, interestingly enough. This kind of theme of trains goes through my work too. And I sent some stuff there, but mostly I found everything in Lille. All these objects, I made this kind of salon style based on the Paris salon installation, this cabinet of curiosity. And they, they said, we want you to build this giant installation, but no one can enter it. So people could see it through the window. They'd see all of this. This is all stuff I found in basically the largest flea market in Europe called the Lille Broderie. But then through a window in the center, you'd see the real installation, well, the second part of the installation, which is this giant tower of Babel made out of stones. All things found at, at the train station. All the railroad ties, all the cobblestones, all these concrete things I decided were, again, seats to kind of worship this giant ambiguous object. That's the backside. Those are all the railroad ties. And nobody can enter this space. So they can only look at it through the window. There's something almost interesting about that, like it's this preserved archaeological dig. All artifacts I found and put in there. And it's really nice at night because we get these great shadows. So the last projects I'll show you, really it's what I'm working on now. I got this wild hair up my ass about working with Detroit Park sculptures that are being destroyed. Suddenly I have like this ambition to save them and reuse them somehow. So there's all these old abandoned parks in Detroit where there used to be all these concrete statuaries. A lot of people know what they are. A lot of people don't know that the dolphins and turtles and these castle things were all designed and made by a Detroit artist who went to Cranbrook, went to Wayne State, went to U of M, taught at U of M. His name is Jim Miller Melberg. And all these things that I played with as a child are all disappearing. They're, they're considered too dangerous now. So I want to try and save them. Even these old rusty, crazy things. And how it ends up being manifesting, I, I don't quite know yet, but I, there's some people in Detroit who have been interested in maybe trying to preserve them. And then the other project, I just got a Knight Foundation grant for, and I'm, I'm working on, it's going to take about a year and a half to complete it, but 
It's based on trying to use these old sign armatures in Detroit where there used to be all these giant elaborate signs hanging off. I want to make new signs. <laughs> vacuum form signs like this. The old vacuum form signs that kind of instantly look aged. And I want to base them on the history of the area of the city. I want to base them on the history of the building. I want to play again with mythology, play again with uh, alchemy, symbolism, and put new signs where the old signs used to be. And last but not least, the Earthwork Project. I'm still slowly plotting through this because in Detroit, there's a new bridge being built across the Detroit River, and that's the exact area where the, historic, uh, the, the history of the ancient Native Americans lived in Detroit. So I'm documenting the crap out of this area before it all changes. Yeah. That's about it, I suppose. Thank you. I have no idea what time it is. I hope we're okay for time. Um, but I, I will say that we're planning on doing a, a Q&A if anybody's interested in asking me questions, if anyone has comments, if anyone wants to harass the hell out of me. We're going to go next door to the, uh, I don't know if it's called the lecture hall, but the other theater, the smaller theater. Um, come, ask me questions. I love to talk about crap. Please come. <laughs>